Get in the cart. Right at us. Four. The best in the business, Roger Cleveland. Can't wait to get back to Chicago in this one. This is Party of Four, a Mistwood Golf Club podcast. And just like that, it is the U.S. Open happening now. Exciting times, Andy. How are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. This is like my favorite uh, favorite time of year to to start watching golf. Nice. Why is that? Uh, just the U.S. Open. Like I, I can remember back to as a kid, just watching hours and hours and hours of the U.S. Open. And the U.S. Open's always been one traditionally that they don't care about the consolidated TV time. Like if you want to watch it at 8 a.m. and you want to watch it at 6 p.m., you're going to have it the whole gamut. You can watch literally 40 plus hours of, of coverage. It's crazy. It's a good point. Ben Hutchison alongside Andy Michelson here for the party of four podcast. And it is summertime. I'm excited. I haven't looked at a lot of the U S open uh, results so far, the early uh, leaderboard there, but I did see that Abraham answer withdrew. So that means Ricky Fowler is just one WD away from playing. I think he might get in. We were talking about before the John Daly story of being ninth alternate the night before. There's always a chance. There's always something that that happens. If Ricky Fowler stands there next to the first tee, there's there's a good chance he might get in. I can't imagine what goes through the golfers' heads. I've seen more recently on the Corn Ferry Tour that happened with a guy from Yale, and he made it just in time using someone else's club, someone else's shoes. And then he's, hey, guys, how's it going? I'm here. I made it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, to a much smaller scale, I did that for an Illinois Open once. I was like some alternate down the way and literally just stood there and watched every single player tee off. <laughs> waited and waited and waited and waited and didn't get in. But, uh, yeah, I think I think we've all been there at some point where you're just kind of hoping that you you get into, into the field. So you didn't get in. I was going to say don't minimize your accomplishments here. No, <laughs> no, no, I didn't get in. It was the craziest thing. So I was in a... I was in a playoff to get into the Illinois Open. It was like 10 guys for one spot type of thing, and I was second or third, and then just on a whim, I was like, eh, what the heck? I was actually working backdrop. Funny story. I'm working backdrop out here. It's like <laughs> it's like 6.30 in the morning, and our old GM comes walking up. And he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what do you mean what I'm doing here? I'm, I'm working. He goes, it's the first day of the Illinois Open, and you're like the first or second alternate. I'm like, okay. He's like, well, are you going to go up there? And it was up at Royal Fox out over an hour away. And uh, I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, so I hop in the car. I get there. I open my trunk. No clubs. <laughs> Swear to God, no clubs. <laughs> so I'm like, a, I got my, like my tail between my legs. I have, I'm at like, I think I'm 19 years old at the time. I don't know any, any of the pros. It's not like now, like where, Hey, it's a buddy. I walk in the shop and go, Hey, yeah. Can I borrow your clubs for a day? You know, it's kind of like the guy did on the corn ferry tour. I walk in the shop. I go, okay, here's the situation. <laughs> uh, just basically came up here on a whim. I still had my Mistwood staff shirt on. I swear to God, I had a Mistwood shirt that said staff on it. It was this ugly $5 cheap, crummy blue shirt that we used to wear back in the day. So I'm standing there and I don't, I don't even have pants. Then you have to, had to wear pants back in the day in the Illinois open. So I'm sitting there, I'm in shorts. I'm in my Mistwood staff shirt, walking into a pro shop. I've got no clubs, no balls, no tees, no gloves, no hats, none of that stuff. So I'm in there like a, like a 20 handicapper, like, Hey, I need a glove. I need some balls. I need some tees just for the happenstance that, uh, that I get in. And I remember, uh, (laughs) they happen to have like a junky, junky rental set. For some reason, the pro was kind of being stingy about it. I don't want to cast spells, but this is a long time ago. I don't know who it was, but they gave me this really junky rental set. And I remember like, it was like an old set of like a box set of stratas. Like, I mean, literally (laughs) club pro guy level, and I'm standing there just waiting, waiting, waiting. I watched literally every single group tee off from about 8.30 all the way through 2.30, and I didn't get in. But, yeah, that was a memorable experience at the very least. <laughs> Man, you probably have two golf bags in your car at all times, I feel I, like now. I never go anywhere without clubs <laughs> yeah. in my trunk. And it was it's that situation alone. And the weirdest thing is I can't tell you how many times, and I can, and I'm sure there's plenty of people that identify with me, how many times I'll put my clubs in my trunk five minutes into the trip. I do this a lot. Five minutes into the trip, I'll go, oh, shoot, did I remember my clubs? 
I'll pull over to the side of the road, open the trunk, just double check that I have my, my clubs and my shoes. I do that all the time. And I'm sure everyone else can identify with that. It's like the craziest thing. You do it once, and for the rest of your life, you're just in complete fear. I'm guilty of that when it comes to did I shut the garage door? And I'll drive around like the block or turn around three minutes. But I've since upgraded my garage door to the Bluetooth where I can do it on my phone. So now I don't have to do that. Oh, but that's nice. you can just push the button. It says open or closed. And you trust that it's obviously working. That's nice. Yeah. So um, the taxes in Lockport are very high. <laughs> and uh, I'm very thankful for the uh, Lockport PD shout out that at least once a month, they're usually shutting my garage at 2 a.m. Uh, it's just one of those things I completely forget all the time, too. <laughs> I do lock the internal door. I just forget yeah. sometimes to lock or to shut the garage. So they're very nice. They shut my garage. They'll put a note right on my door saying, hey, you know, just be careful more often. There's a lot of break-ins in the area and all that stuff. I just love it there. It's great. So I guess the higher taxes, I'm actually, like, paying for the service. It's, it's kind of nice. You are, but other Lockport residents are paying for your services, in I, I pay plenty for that service. Yeah, me. that's that's so nice of them. Just, <laughs> guys, yep, yep. Andy same, left his garage door open again. Same guy, same guy. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the U.S. Open. And again, we haven't really been looking at the leaderboard. You might have looked at the leaderboard. I don't know, but uh, it's early returns right now. Obviously, do you have any favorites? Ooh, you know, can I go sleeper first? Is if sure. He, if he top, if he top ten in the PGA, is he a sleeper? I, I mean, s- I still call Cam Young a sleeper. I mean, he, you know, corn for a guy last year. I got I, Cam Young. Yeah, I think Cam Young's got. Oh, you actually bet Cam Young. That's what you're saying. Yes, I put three dollars on Cam Young. Oh man, that's a commitment right there. <laughs> yeah, I I think Cam Young is is a pretty special player. I mean, why why don't you pick Justin Thomas again? Um, the Country Club is an old traditional golf course, uh, a lot of history there. Uh, we have one locally that's very much like that, like Chicago Golf Club. You have to hit shots into it. You have to hit the ball high. Uh, you have to be able to shape it, and no one is doing that better right now in the world than Justin Thomas. I'm seeing a lot of experts picking Jordan Spieth. I don't know if that's because the, the greens and the green complexes and, and the green surrounds are so severe. You know, when they take when they take these classic courses – the original course designers that that built these courses aren't intend or weren't intending or couldn't even envision a day where they would be stimping out, meaning green speeds at 13, 14 feet. That is insane. That is the literal equivalent to putting on your hardwood floor with a little bit of friction on it. Mm. It is lightning fast. So when these when you go and play these old classic golf courses and they had the reason I say this because old classic golf courses have, have a lot of undulation on the greens because they're trying to run off the water, right? Traditionally back in the day, they didn't have these big fancy sprinkler systems. We have, they didn't have sub air, all those things. So when you have those contours and they're rolling at that crazy speed, you better have your short game dialed in. You better have your approach shots dialed in to be in the right spots. Cause there's spots where you can't even get to the hole. You can't even approach the hole. And you saw some of that like at, at Wingfoot back in the day. The redesign kind of softened it up a little bit. But but those old classic golf courses, when you have them putting at the speeds that they're putting at, it makes it extremely, extremely difficult. And somebody that has to be very precise with their with their shots coming in more than more than ever. I think too, in addition to Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy is playing amazing golf right now. I think you could probably pick either of those guys and do pretty well. Uh, I also have, I had more of a long shot of Mito Pereira. Obviously, he had uh, some good moments, but a bit of a collapse, really? if you will. Yeah, really, really going to meet. Okay, going to Mito. He was sixty-five to one. Okay. Uh, what do you think of Terrell Hatton? Not bad. <laughs> he was a hundred to one. Not not bad. I w- I would say. I just like the guy that hits it, yeah, that hits it high. I mean, obviously, length does matter a little bit, but I think it's it's the guy that hits it high and it's just just the traditional ball strikers. This is going to be a traditional ball striker win. This isn't going to be a surprise win. This isn't going to be some rando winning. This is going to be 
your stock 10 guys. That's a bad spot for Mito because I think the last time I saw him play, he hits a pretty low ball. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one person I thought you'd bring up earlier would be Xander Shoffley because he's just he's destined at some point to win. Yeah, it's it's kind of been weird. He's been been kind of quiet lately, but it, I don't think he's doing anything different. I don't think anything is really. Um, it, that's what golf is. I mean, he could be a half. I don't. I haven't looked up his exact stats, but he could be a half shot worse this year, and you never hear, hear of him, right? I mean, that's how how finite uh, golf is. But he always finds his form, especially in the majors. Um, you know, his coming out party was Aaron Hills, and he really hasn't been outside top five or ten in the. U.S. Open especially. It's a perfect golf. I mean, you could say this about 20 guys. He's perfectly suited for this golf course. He drives it on a string. He is able to shape shots. He's very precise with his iron play. He's very precise with his wedge play. The only thing you can say about Xander is when the pressure gets on, he gets a little suspect with his putter. Other than that, he's got all the tools. Like, you could pick any of these guys. I mean... I'll bet a sneaky pick, and you always fall in love with this guy. Is Patrick Cantley? I mean, he'd be a good pick too. <laughs> you always you have so much love for Patrick. It's crazy. So much love for Patrick. So much love. No, that's Will's out Taurus. I'm not going with him this tournament. I just I don't think he's got it for this tournament. Not one of my picks. Yeah, I mean Xander's. Yeah, Xander's struggling early. Will's struggling early. Bob, uh, he's but peaking. He's peaking I at am, the leaderboard. I am, pe- I am peaking. I am peaking. Thursday morning you, recording. You know who's an interesting story. Uh, that I'm seeing more and more about. Had that really um, nice moment a couple of years ago too. Brandon Matthews, the longest driver of the golf ball on any professional tour in the world, had the chance to play with him a couple of years ago. I think we've talked about him before. He could be an interesting one for this. I mean, if he if he's super aggressive, just think of how short of clubs he's coming in those greens with. I mean, if you're coming in, I don't care if it's from the rough. You're coming in with with lob wedge. It's gonna stop. Ball stops two ways. What are those two ways? Can you name it, Ben? No. Spin and height. We just went through this oh, in our wedge clinic. We did. Come we on. had wedge clinic last week. Come on. I didn't know that's what spin, we're going back to. Spin and height or spin or height. Okay. So if he's coming in high enough with just even even some spin on it, the ball's going to stop on the green. So, you know, Brandon Matthews is an interesting pick. Any any bombers, not the not the worst pick in the world, but I, I like the guy that's got the complete game that is – kind of the guy that drives on a string and can bring in high and shape shots. All signs point to Justin Thomas. There you go. Scotty Scheffler, obviously, uh, favorite up there at the top. John Rahm. You got Brooks Kepka. a lot of these expert she- picks. Scheffler's favorite, huh? Uh, it's kind of interchangeable with him and Thomas okay. and Rory. So a lot of the bets and things that out there are like, Thomas, McElroy, and Rom, all top five, including ties, stuff like that, where they're really clumping the favorites up there. But in golf, we talk about the the parody. I mean, Mac- McElroy could be scary this week, though, because he was at the RBC. If you watch the final round, he was shaping shots. And if Rory's, like, feeling it, Rory's the greatest, I, I think, he's Tiger-level ball striker, like, when he's feeling it. And Rory was kind of feeling it last week. And, and if he's still got that same feel, then... He's as dangerous as anybody. You can well, pick him every single week. Absolute overall favorite for this was Rory. So people are seeing it. Wow. He passed Scheffler. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why. It... <laughs> Golf's funny. Maybe it's just the age that we live in, but you got a guy that's won so much as Scotty Scheffler has every time he's teeing it up that he's still not the favorite. That's crazy. Just what have you done for me lately? True. Well, one other topic at the U.S. Open this week is the Live Golf Tour. I think there's 13 guys that are in the field. What's that? Never heard of it. Yeah, I don't know. I think any major podcast such as ours and (laughs) news coverage, sports coverage, all of it, uh, you have to have some Live Golf in there. Otherwise, you're just not relevant. Yeah, I I, I agree. Interesting stuff that came out this week, and I – Made me almost spit my coffee out. They <laughs> offered John Rom four hundred million dollars. What a classy answer, though. What a classy answer. It's good. Basically, you know, he's he's into the tradition of golf and and wants to focus on on that tradition. You know, mentioned even him and Tiger are the only two people that will win at Torrey Pines. Like he thinks about all that history things. Um, kind of poo pooed it real quick by saying, you know, fifty four holes is not an event. Uh, 
playing a shotguns on an event, you know, just, just little shots here and there. I don't think he's like totally trying to take shots like some of the other players have. Um, but yeah, class response, you know, I could, he goes, I could retire right now and I'd be fine. My family would be fine. Um, but I, I'm just really kind of in, in here to make my mark on history and the best way to do that's a PGA tour. Did you watch any of the tournament last weekend? I did. And of course I did. What'd you think of the coverage? Dude, dude I used to watch, I, I watched the most random like DP world tour stuff. I'll yeah. watch, I watch like the the women's random European tour stuff. Like I, I watch golf. You watch it on That's Facebook it. or YouTube or I watch it on YouTube. <laughs> okay. I Roku TV. Shout out to Roku. It brought it up on my uh, on my TV. It was actually it was okay to watch. Uh, funny thing was was as I was watching it. So my dad is sitting there watching it with me. So you got one generation, and then my kids come in and they have a different perspective on it. So my daughter comes in. She watches it for five minutes. She goes. Ooh, I like that leaderboard on the side of the TV. And then she also liked the like Madden power rankings. Did you see that? Like when they bring a player up, they're like, this guy sucks at driving, but this guy's great at putting and this guy's iron play is okay. She kind of liked like all of that because she likes to, you know, play games like that. And, yeah. you know, they're real big into like MLB the show right now. So like it has all that and where it ranks the players. So that's smart. Um on the final day, I I'm guilty to say this. I know on the final day, I love the shotgun. I love, actually, I hate the thought of shotgun, but I love the fact that they're all playing at the same time. I love, I kind of love that. Golfer to golfer, and you're, it's a lot quicker. Yeah, it's just like, I wish there's a way, and I've been, I've been wrecking my brain. There's no good way to do it outside of a shotgun to create that, that buzz where the whole course is playing at the same time. Because think about, Think about how many times have we seen a guy come back from five back, six back, seven back. If they were playing at the same time as that leader, the pressure there changes because you have three holes to play. I have three holes to play, right? So our score is actually even up where instead of the guy having the clubhouse lead and sitting there for two, three hours, that's a different, it's a different type of pressure. It, it, it was unique it was different. The field was lacking. The play was lacking. I thought it was a really dumb, dumb move by Liv Tour to, to pick a course that's that freaking hard, right? Why would you pick a course that's hard for your first event? We're trying to make a stamp on it, and you have Phil shoot plus nine? Yeah. What are you doing? Like, have a birdie fest. Set it up as easy as possible. Have guys shoot 30, you know, 30 under. Charles Schwartz played like a god, shot eight under. Like, played great. I was watching shots, you know, of him hitting. He played great. He played awesome. But why would you have the setup be that hard if you're trying to really make a stamp on things? You got past USAM champs, Ogletree, that shot, what, plus a million? <laughs> I, I don't know what the score was, but uh, I'm pretty sure I see it most of the time in the Sunday Skins game out here. It's like, it's a joke how uh, how high that, that score was. I think the quality of field, the interesting thing is that if, if this starts to gather a lot of steam, right? And we want to still keep those forty-eight player fields. How do they push some of the guys out that are fringe guys that are just kind of filling the fields right now? And how do they work some of these other contract players in? I mean, they probably just pay them not to play. Be After like, the US Open, you're going to see you're <laughs> going to see five to five to ten more names drop, and they're they're promising some monsters. Okay, I guess that's where next week. Okay, who's going to drop? Who's going to go? Victor Hovland's going to be number one. He's going to go. I, I would have said total dark horse. I would have said Jordan Spieth. Jeez. Which would have changed everything, right? I would have said Jordan Spieth until this whole, like, Kevin Knox change that was pretty highly publicized uh, where they just didn't, didn't talk to each other. Yeah. But think about it. Why is, like, the golden boy, right? He's like, Jordan Spieth is like the Dallas Cowboys of golf, right? Everybody loves him. He can stink. Everybody still loves him. He hasn't said boo about this whole live tour. Justin Thomas and Rory, every time they wake up, it seems like their number one priority for that day is to trash live tour. And and Jordan Spieth hasn't said a word. Now, Jordan Spieth has some major contracts in place. He's got a 30-year deal with AT&T. He's got a 10-year deal with Under Armour. Um, but that's why I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't kind of picked a side. 
And I think too, we talked about Brooks. Brooks sending, is gone. Sending Brooks Chase is gone. over there just Brooks to be is like, gone. "Hey, He's, check yeah. it out." Hey, Chase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See how good the players are getting treated, and why don't you be the sacrificial lamb and uh, you know, slide you a few mil and and all good. Well, in his quote at his DJ, press conference, you think DJ knows that's not the PJ Tour yet? I don't know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not knows. sure. But no, Brooks said to the questions he was getting was, I don't understand. I'm trying to focus on the U.S. Open, man. I legitimately don't get it. I'm tired of the conversations. I'm tired of all this stuff. Like I said, y'all are throwing a black cloud on the U.S. Open. I think that Right, sucks. but he didn't say he was out. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do feel bad for them for once because it's a bleep situation. We're here to play, and you're talking about an event that happened last week. Yeah, but what about the next event, Brooks? Like, dude, he's he's already got his plane tickets. Right. He's good. I'll tell you what, you tell ask a casual golf fan what the next or where the next live event is, and you ask the next or the casual golf fan what the next PJ Tour event is. I'll bet more fans know where the next live event is. I do. It's at Pumpkin Ridge. It's in yep. Portland. Yeah. The fact that when this whole thing was coming together, I thought everything was going to be like overseas. It was just, hey, this tournament over there for all the fans over there. And then it's like, it's all coming here. Yeah, that was the whole complicated mess was the fact that there's a bylaw in the PJ Tour bylaws that you can't have a competing tour uh, on U.S. soil at the same time. So these players uh, aren't able to do that. I'm I'm kind of, I don't know. I'm, I'm like conflicted. I'm confused by it. Yes, I want the the PGA Tour to reign supreme forever. But I'm confused as to how the PGA Tour legally can be that constrictive with with the tour that they're offering when the players are not necessarily signed by the tour, or are they? It's that's it's, what I was going to say. Is really it like a contract weird. when you get into the PGA Tour, like you sign your life away? Well, you're a member of it. I know you're right? a member, so you're a member of the PGA Tour, and, and like like a membership at a club, a member membership has its privileges, and if you break those privileges, you can get booted from a club, yeah. right? So, uh, I I guess in a way that's that's true. Um, yeah, and that and that's the problem, right? Is is I think the the narrative, the the PR game of of this has been very very poorly done from the start. I, I said it before: if the live tour, instead of letting the narrative be shaped as this dirty money and politics come into play first, and then you talk about the golf, instead of, hi, I'm Dustin Johnson. I've done what I want to do on the PGA Tour. I want to have a life now that I have a family where uh, I am able to play less golf. I'm still able to focus on my family, on the golf, and be competitive uh, in a format that I enjoy. Blah, 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 blah. Boom. You're done. Right? And then the messaging, I thought the messaging from the press conferences, when you listen to some of the guys' answers, was was well, fine. I mean, there's everyone's going to say, okay, they're chasing the money, they're chasing the money. Sure, fine, they're chasing the money. They're chasing the money for a, a better lifestyle. So the better lifestyle and the chasing the money kind of go a little bit hand in hand, but it's it was every answer that they gave. Now, maybe they were coached, I'm sure they were, to, to take the lifestyle angle, but some, some of it was believable. Like, I can understand it's a better lifestyle. I can understand the guy take a few of those college players where they're not going to be in that top 15 where they're they're going to get taken straight into the corn ferry tour they're trying to still find an opportunity to play early on here when the live tour is trying to find its spot in golf and they get invited to play in those why wouldn't you play in those like why why wouldn't you why wouldn't you play in those i think a lot of it is for the guys that are taking the money whatever if you can get past the morality of taking the money or how you feel about it or what you believe has happened or how they operate. That's where the guys take the money. So from a public standpoint, I think it's a situation where do you honestly cast these people out at that point? Is Phil going to be booed at this tournament by people? You know, it depends how the public kind of perceives what's happening there. And if it is dirty money or not, or, you know, however they see it. I mean, we can bring politics into it. It's as much our fault as anything, right? We've let this inflation happen. They keep pumping oil. Like, our our understanding of money is 
completely different of their understanding of money. We see money as a fixed resource, right? I make so much, you make so much. That's our fixed resource. If I had a money tree, in this case, a bunch of oil pits that I could just keep pumping, then money has no value. So for us to put value on what 200 million is, for us to put value on what 400 million is, there, th there's no such thing. It's a never ending resource for the Middle East, right? So, you know, they, they can, they can do what we do. They do because from a economic political standpoint, we've, we've made this bet. This is, this is somewhat our fault. This, this isn't the American backed golf league by American oil money. This is dirty political Saudi money that have had some very bad ties to very bad things in the past. Um, but it's, I don't know. We play in China. The PJ tour plays in China. I actually have family that have lived in China. China is a horrific, horrific place. Our listeners in China, too bad. Go away. China is a horrific place, right? You have some horrific places that they play PJ tour events. You have some horrific places that, that we endorse in the United States and make money off of and our athletes make money off of. When you of. see the NBA going places like that, like it is. Right. It is. Right. Nike's are aren't made in Oregon, tell you that much. You know? Those those things are, I mean, there's an ugly side to every piece of these sports and they're not going away. The Saudi stuff golf was not the first one. Guess what? It was Formula One. Guess what? They basically control the Premier League right now. They're buying team after team after team. Guess who else has Premier League teams? Russians. Like, unless we want to do a control-alt-delete, this isn't going away. It's not going away. So they're they're calling it sports washing. Yeah, sure, it is. It is. It's, it's sports, sports washing across the board. Um, I think things like probably major league baseball and football might be the only ones that are probably protected long-term. But when you look at these sports that have a, a more of a global play, a global play, global impact, um, you're going to see that money talks and I'm sorry, that's the ugly reality of it all. And guess what? Tiger used to get paid in 2000 to go play in Dubai. The year he won, I think it was 2000, 2001. He wins in Dubai. He gets a $5 million appearance fee. Again, that's Dubai. Same money that this all is coming from, right? And his first place prize was like two seventy five. Yeah. <laughs> this has been happening for a while. And it's just an ugly reality. I'm and, sorry. And it's market value. There's market value, right? Everything in this world has market value, and this is what it is. Sorry. There's a lot of people out there that love it. There's a lot of people out there voicing they don't like it, but... I think I, no matter what, live golf is going to grow and I it's going to get more people. I don't like it, but it's golf. Like I'm, I'm going to watch golf. I'm sorry. And that doesn't mean I'm an ethically bad person. And that doesn't mean the people that watch are ethically bad people. They like to watch golf. And if I have to watch Dustin Johnson play in the middle of nowhere for whatever, I'm still going to watch him play. He's a great golfer. I like to watch him play. I'm going to watch golf. I'm not endorsing anything politically that they did or wherever that money's coming from. I'm watching golf. Sorry. That's what it is. Very well said. All right, Andy. We had a goal of getting a guest on this week. It didn't work out. So I think, do we have to promise to have a guest on for the next show? Yeah, like pinky swear. We have to pinky swear. It's, yeah. With our audience. Yeah. Our viewers, our listeners. I used to have so much fun talking to you. I hate to have a third person ruin this all, you know? <laughs> No one likes a third wheel, Andy. We know that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Hope it was insightful. We're excited. It's summer. There's golf. And we will see all of you next time. Get in the car. Right at us. Lord! The best in the business. Roger Cleveland. Can't wait to get back to Chicago in this one. This is Party of Four, a Mistwood Golf Club podcast.